Hi, this is Angelo John for the Sacred Inclusion Network. What follows is a online community exploration uh, interview presentation by Jonathan Adams. Uh, we do these on the third Saturday of every month, and um, I thought I'd share it with you. Let me tell you a little bit about Jonathan Adams. Um, he's had essentially two lives. Um, one is his pre-Sonic Yogi life, where he was a professional musician, which is basically how he started his career. Um, he recorded albums for classical guitar for a number of labels, and he later co-founded the classical fusion group Montana Skies, which toured nationally for over a decade. In 2012, um, Jonathan had um, uh, what might be called a very traumatic slash religious experience. Um, he experienced extreme anxiety, and as a professional musician, he knew the um, you know the impact of sound on other people. And uh, I suppose you might say that he turned uh, his knowledge of sound inward and uh, became this person that now has the monitor of the sonic yogi. Um, I'll, read, I'll read from his bio here. He says he put his intention and focus into the exploration of the healing potential of music and has given talks and workshops on vibrational sound therapy at TEDx, National Spiritual Living Conferences, and much more. You can find a lot of his stuff on Spotify, Pandora, the SoundCloud, and YouTube. And I encountered him uh, by taking his course on the Insight Timer app, Insight Timer app, uh, which I heartily recommend. In any event, um, here with warts and all, because this is not um, a professional recording, uh, here's Jonathan Adams from our exploration. And uh, please send us any comments, any thoughts. Uh, that's it. Here's Jonathan. Welcome, Jonathan Adams. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, wonderful. Um, so, um, just to tell you a little bit about my experience um, beyond what uh, Angela just mentioned. Um, I started off as a professional musician, um, and um, so I studied music. My, my main instrument was classical guitar in school, and then I toured for many years with the classical fusion group. Um, and then around eight or nine years ago, in 2011, um, I had an experience um, of really deep anxiety. And, um, I had had little panic attacks here and there before that, but this was kind of a, um, or was a very intense experience. And um, can you still hear me? Yeah, we have. We just have another person joining us. It's okay. Okay. Um, and um, and so uh, during that experience, it was really kind of like my nervous system had been stripped uh, bare. And it gave me an opportunity to really understand my physical body and my mental self on a much deeper level. Um, and during that process, um, I also learned a lot about how sound and vibration affect our physical body. Um, and um, so I'm going to share a little bit of that with you today. Um, and I'll stop here and there for questions since we're, we're a group and just to keep it interactive. So, um, so um, I'm going to cut right into it and basically talk about sound and our brain waves. And um, so we have some basic brain wave states. Um, they are um, alpha or beta, excuse me, alpha, theta, and delta. And I'm using my hand to sort of show those levels because they are, by frequency, they're analogous to sort of the EQ on our stereo. Um, so beta would be like, by analogy, the treble end, alpha and theta would be mid-range, and delta would be the bass. Um, and each of these also have a state of consciousness. So beta is our normal waking state, alpha and theta are more meditative states, and delta is um, a sleep state. 
And so I realized in that time of deep anxiety that I was in a really high beta, so a little bit beyond what our normal state is. And I was experiencing a lot of rapid thoughts, um, a lot of mind chatter, and a lot of physical stress, muscle tension, short breathing, um, these types of things. And, um, and during that experience, um, I uh, was guided to some sound therapy by a friend and I listened to that and it helped me to um, relax my mind. When I listened, what, it, what I found was that not only did my mind get quiet, but that my body also began to release, my, my muscle tension um, released, my breathing became deeper. And um, so for the first time during that experience, um, I was able to find some peace. Um, and so uh, I realized that sound was a really valuable tool. Um, and I'm a curious person and as a musician as well, I, I began to look at, you know, how is it that frequency can affect us mentally and physically beyond what I had already known music to do. Um, and so, um, of course, I'm cutting out a lot of, of the parts of that experience. It was, a, um, it was a psychological experience of kind of purging um, old emotions and fears um, and, and coming to a different understanding of myself as well. But, um, but just as far as the sound component, um, sound was an important tool in that. So, um, so, so I, I realized that, that our brain waves um, were a key component and we have different rhythms in the body. Um, so what are some main rhythms? Does anybody want to speak out and tell me what's a, what's a rhythm or a vibration in our body? I'll just say that everybody's on mute, so you should oh, unmute, okay. un unmute yourself before you talk. And uh, yeah, or how about our heartbeat? <laughs> okay, yeah, heartbeat. Um, um, so I'll, I'll just go through them since we're on mute, and I'm not totally familiar with this format. But um, so we have a heartbeat. We have um, breath, um, which we're breathing in a rhythm, and then on a more subtle level, we have brain waves. Um, of course, we have pulsation in our vessels. We have circadian rhythms that are our sleep rhythms that are um, aligned with the sun. And um, we have digestive rhythms and so on and so forth. But our brain waves, our heartbeat, and our breath are all connected in the nervous system and in the parasympathetic nervous system. So as we... Um, bring those brain waves down into that mid-range meditative alpha and theta state. Um, it also helps our entire nervous system to begin to relax um, and come into that state of relaxation. And um, so, so one thing that sounds can do, and I'm grabbing my Tibetan bowl, is to help us come into that brainwave state. Um, let's see, I have a phantom bowl here. Not sure if you can hear this, but when I play a Tibetan bowl, you can hear a sort of a wah 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 sound, an oscillation in there. And those rhythmic oscillations are what tend to help our brain waves um, come into that more relaxed space of being. And so. Um, Brain, uh, sound waves and brain waves, incidentally, are measured in hertz. And so over time, our brain waves tend to synchronize to those um, rhythmic patterns or entrain is another word for it and help us to come into those states um, of relaxation um, with the sound waves. So that's one way that sound can sort of affect us. Another way is that when I play the sounds or if you've had a chance to listen to my, my recordings, um, you'll notice with the Tibetan bowls that there is no 
really melody, rhythm, or harmony. And so um, sound therapy is different than music in that aspect. Music is, in a, in a sense, ordered sound. And so um, our mind typically likes order. And um, so when we listen to music, what we're hearing is harmony or the stacking of different notes that sound pleasant. Um, we have melody, we have rhythm. And so all of this creates an order and that's sort of a function of our left brain. And so when we hear um, that order, we find it pleasing. Um, and in, in all artwork, there is a there is a tension and resolution, whether we're talking about a great painting, a great novel, great piece of music, there's always tension and resolution. And in fact, the whole scheme of Western music theory is sort of based on tension and resolution. And, um, and so our nervous system is also experiencing that tension and resolution. Um, I'm going to diverge just a second here and sort of vamp on this idea. But um, as I've learned in my spiritual studies over the last decade, Buddha also talked about the um, craving and aversion as the two things that keep us from um, really understanding and realizing the truth. And that the middle path or the path of equanimity was sort of to be free of that craving and aversion. And so as we look out into, you know, our world and the way it's structured, we can see that, you know, the marketers are really pushing us towards craving and the fear mongers and the media are pushing us um, towards aversion. And in either case, we, we are giving up our sovereignty and our, 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 um, yeah, I guess our, our ability to govern ourselves to other entities that are really looking to control us. And, and our own mind does it to us too, not to blame it all on external forces. Our own mind does it to us. And then that's sort of um, uh, what Buddha was, was, I think, teaching us, was to watch out for these um, factors within our own nervous system. Well, music is a great analogy for that. Um, so with the standard music we're used to, we hear that tension and resolution. And um, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just another way of expressing. Then with sound therapy, there isn't the melody, harmony, and rhythm. And so we can sort of let go of that left brain and really kind of come over into our right brain and simply hear the frequencies themselves without the, um, without that structure of tension and resolution, which, which really forces us to judge. When we hear music, we immediately, whether we think it or not, we are probably thinking, is that good or bad? You know, do I like this or do I not like this? And, um, so that's also part of our fear-based nervous system. And with sound therapy, um, we tend to not have those same layers of judgments because we haven't formulated what is good or bad. We're just hearing the frequencies. Um, when we hear a bird sing or the wind whisper through the trees or the crickets, we don't think, oh, that cricket's really out of tune, you know, or or that bird, you know, oh my goodness, I can't believe that bird's singing like that. We just kind of hear it for what it is and, and, um, and we take it in. And um, so in a way, I see sound therapy as just mimicking nature, um, giving us a chance to sort of unplug from that mind um, of judgment and um, that's recognizing those patterns. And of course, that is also connected to our survival instinct. Um, you know, we learn to do this or that for this or that outcome. And, um, and so that is all connected to how we survive. Um, and so that 
you know, by default is connected into that survival mechanism of our nervous system. And um, so just to reference some sort of pop neuroscience, you probably are all aware of the amygdala and sort of the reptilian brain. And then we are aware that sort of our higher functioning is this frontal cortex. Um, and so um, I see now meditation, mind-body practice as a way of sort of letting go of some of those um, survival instincts or at least reining them in so that we don't um, find ourselves in a world of illusion, um, thinking that everything is the bogeyman. Um, and, um, and so music is a great way to sort of activate that relaxation. So a third thing, and then I'll open up for some questions, is that um, studies have set, found that music therapy um, can help to sort of um, encourage melatonin release. Melatonin is um, produced by our pineal gland and is related to our circadian rhythms. Um, and researchers are now also finding that there's other chemicals produced by the pineal gland. And one of them um, of interest of late is DMT or dimethyltryptamine which they found in the pineal glands of rats. And there's still some debate about uh, whether that exists in humans, at least from a scientific, scientifically proven perspective. But DMT is, of course, a um, sort of psychedelic substance, too, that has been associated with mystical states. Um, and, um, and so that would also be produced by the pineal gland. and. Um, but melatonin, as it naturally is secreted from our, our brains, helps us to go to sleep. So when, when the sun, you know, goes down at night, that automatically sort of activates that system in our bodies. And we would begin to um, release melatonin, which helps us to begin to relax. It helps us to go from beta down into alpha, theta, and then ultimately delta where we go to sleep. So every day we sort of go through this process of cycling down through our brain waves as we go to sleep. And that is also the same process um, in my view of what happens when we're meditating or going through a mind-body practice. When we go to sleep, we cycle down and we lose consciousness as we open up our su subconscious and we then begin to dream in our sleep. Um, in meditation and mind-body practice, we cycle through those states, but we have the opportunity to retain consciousness and then look at the contents of our subconscious mind. So, I mean, that's something that that may be a rare occurrence and maybe requires practice, but um, in my view, that's sort of the opportunity that we have in any of these practices. Um, so I'm gonna pause right there and, and just open up for any questions uh, or comments or thoughts. Well, um, I'll just say if you can hear me guys, okay? Yes. Cool. Thank you so much for sharing um, in such a concise and uh, digestible way. Um, I love the, the connection to the brain waves. That's heavily what I do in my work, especially getting to the subconscious mind. And it helps to hear in that way of um, the pineal gland. I've, I've done a lot of research. I'm a trauma survivor and live with PTSD. And I hadn't heard the research yet on the pineal gland. So thank you for bringing that to my attention. I'm really excited to dive more into that research because um, I've heard the amygdala and cortex, but um, also I just really enjoyed the sound healing is mimicking nature. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I, as like intuitively I've known that, but just to hear you say it so simply, um, 
I just really appreciated that that's just your simplicity and how you speak. So thank you so much for the clarity. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I also um, am a recover, recovery, I guess you would say, from trauma and, um, you know, it's probably some level of PTSD. I would imagine any of us could have some level of PTSD. Um, um, and, um, and I see the sort of spiritual or um, the growth process of consciousness as healing and recovering from that trauma, um, which can also skew our view of reality. Um, and so that kind of comes back to that idea of the Buddha of um, allowing those to be continually projected into my present experience. Um, we have a couple of people that joined us. Uh, I'd love to have them, um, you know, just say who you are and uh, why you're at this thing, where you're coming from. This is Jody, and I think somebody with the initials JR. If you'd like to announce yourself, please do so. If not, we'll just keep talking. <laughs> okay. And I will, I will say, I put people on mute. You should be able to remove yourself from mute. Um, but if you can't, um, you could send me a message in the chat and I'll unmute you. Just coming in on the trauma comment just now, um, just thinking about how much music is present tense. Because um, when you're playing, you're absolutely in the moment rather than in memories of yesterday. Mm -hmm. And that might be really important in terms of um, sitting outside a traumatic space. Just in music itself. Yeah, I mean, the experience is such a present tense thing. Um, you're in the moment of playing. You're not in the moment of thinking about last month or next week or something. Yes, I totally agree. And um, I, you're a musician as well, um, just to, for anyone else that's tuning in. Um, and I'm looking back in retrospect, I think that probably one of the things that attracted me to become a musician was the therapeutic aspect of being in my practice time. I, I loved to um, you know, sit with my guitar. I loved to read the music. I loved the way um, what you just described was that I was completely present. Um, and at the same time, the music could sort of um, um, speak to me or be with me. I could, I could be with a great composer like Bach um, and just be immersed in that music. Um, and the therapeutic um, act of just sitting with your instrument for a few hours and being in that space of silence was really healing for me. Um, and um, I would make an analogy from that to also just the practice of meditation now. Um, as a musician, um, we are sort of trained into what practice is, which is to do something daily and consistently. And um, I, I would say the benefits I just described with, with music and just being in that space, I think can also come from a meditation practice. Um, and what I've found is this doing it daily um, is, is similarly healing. Um, also, I just, Brad, being with Bach or any other great composer, uh, with my meditation practice, I feel like I get to be with God and the universe and myself and, um, and with pure silence. Um, and, um, and so that's also a, a healing thing. And anyone can take part in that, whether they know an instrument or not, um, uh, which is nice. Um, so um, those are just some thoughts. Um, related. A question, if that's okay. Sure. Since we're on the conversation about trauma, I was curious if any of you guys who are currently facilitating have um, trauma-informed care practices, like if you've gone through training in order to be trauma-informed with group facilitation and what that looks like for you guys. Um, facilitating as in myself or or, yeah, um, like the group um, sound healings that you do, because I was just looking at your Instagram and it looks like you 
um, have like crystal bowl healing nights and those kinds of things with yoga nidra. And it looks wonderful. And I'm just curious if you guys are utilizing trauma informed practices at all. Um, and what do, what do you mean by trauma informed practices exactly? Sure, just being aware of the nervous system for all people in the room, equitable practices, um, just making sure that everything is more um, like inviting rather than leading, that kind of thing with your language and providing space. Sure. Um, well, yes, I feel like my entire um, angle in this is is trauma informed because I, as I mentioned, I was healing from trauma myself. Um, so I don't have any specific training other than my own experience. Um, but I think if you'll read my blog or check out my course, um, you'll see that I'm always inviting people to use their own mind, use their own judgment. Um, I'm not dictating or sort of um, telling people what they should or shouldn't do. I'm only offering my experience and the tools that have helped me um, and allowing people to um, decide from that angle. Um, I'm pretty clear th in that I'm not a doctor and I'm not a licensed counselor or therapist. I'm just a person that's um, been through a healing experience. And, um, and my desire is to share the tools um, that I've learned. And really my level of expertise is in music and frequency and sound. Um, so I want to kind of use that um, not only from a, you know, talking about it as I am now, but also, um, you know, I share my work really as artwork just to be consumed and hopefully useful um, with people's meditation practice um, and things like that. Uh, you know, Brittany, you asked actually a, a good a question that, that's interest, interesting to me. And I, I'd like to sort of hear your perspective as uh, uh, what you call it, a, you call it trauma, trauma informed practice. Um, you know, um, so uh, I'm just curious as to how you do that. I mean, for me, um, I, I don't really know what that means exactly, but uh, there's something about uh, permission, which I think is important. A lot of times as facilitators, we were very directive and uh, you know, ask people, tell people what to do. You know, close your eyes now, for example, very simple example. Um, however, it's, it's useful, I think, to um, give people an out if they don't want to participate. But in any event, I'd like to hear your, you know, your thoughts as to what you mean by um, trauma. Uh, you know, what, what do you mean? How do you do it? Let me start that way. Sure, that's a great question. Um, and that's exactly right. So as many choice and con consent as possible. So I like to give two different options. So you may close your eyes or if that's not comfortable, find a spot in the room and lower your gaze, more things like that. But then also um, constantly throughout checking in and like creating that, I'm trying to think, like body awareness throughout the practice of not just through sound, but then taking breaks and checking in even with the subconscious mind when we're there of like, how is this feeling in your body? Because I think there's a really easy way for many people who've experienced trauma to dissociate from the body, that the more we can connect back in, then the easier it is to integrate all of these things from mind, body, spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think that's an important question to ask Brittany. Um, and it's something I'm constantly um, in the course of sharing or having group events that I'm constantly navigating um, and um, touching on. In my own experience that I didn't really touch on in the beginning, um, I felt like what I described as this deep anxiety that I had was also a sort of awakening, but it was also um, could be described as a massive release of trauma all at once. And um, I don't know if you've had a chance to listen to the podcast, but um, basically I didn't eat or sleep for several days um, and um, was really just working through all of those issues. And that was an extremely difficult um, experience to navigate. And I felt like, you know, without some divine intervention, I would not have made it through that. 
um, and it was also extremely healing. Um, so, um, yeah, I think it's important to explain to anyone um, that meditation and really any yoga, any mind body practice can release trauma. Um, and um, I fundamentally felt like I was quote unquote normal before that sort of experience that was brought on by meditation and yoga. Um, and, and I wasn't prepared for sort of the intensity of it. Um, and so I think it's important for any practitioner um, to be aware of. And one thing that I have noticed, uh, I've been to, you know, meditation retreats and many yoga classes, and I feel like the conversation of trauma-informed teachers and practitioners is just now beginning to gain a little bit of steam. Um, and um, I think it's an extremely important conversation. Um, and um, for example, uh, I've considered offering a more in-depth um, sound retreat workshop um, in which I would par partner with a psychotherapist um, and uh, you know, have, have a team there to, to handle any um, sort of experiences of release for anyone going through trauma. Um, and I, I think that, um, you know, beginning to have more conversations around mind-body practices and these types of um, trauma-releasing experiences is, is important. So um, thank you for bringing it up. Yeah, thank you for that. And thank you for you know, recognizing the use of other people as resources. And um, yeah, just the essence of collaboration feels really important through this conversation. So thank you. And if anyone's interested, I went through um, the trauma-informed practitioner, it's for well-being practitioners through Shelby Lee, and it was phenomenal. It's an online course, and it was absolutely worth it. Nice. And it's, Shelby Lee is, um, how do you spell that? It's Shelby, it's S-H-E-L-B-Y, and Lee is L-E-I-G-H. Okay. Um, yeah, and she's phenomenal. She's a somatic psychologist. Um, so it's, you're getting it straight from the source. Nice. Um, yeah. Um, wonderful. Um, any other comments or questions? Uh, I, have, I have a question. Um, <laughs> I was just wondering, you know, to what degree you could say that the um, effectiveness of this uh, type of, uh, you know, therapy, let's call it sound therapy, you know, depends on your own uh, personality characteristics. So if, you know, you look at the idea of having um, different forms of uh, intelligence, for example, you mm -hmm. know, that, that there is, you know, some people have more musical intelligence, others natural intelligence, others, you know, logical, linguistic, kinesthetic, whatever. Okay. You know. So, you know, to what degree would, would say a person who has high musical intelligence benefit more from sound therapy than let's say other forms of, um, you know, like mind body practice or other types of therapy? I mean, you know, so to what extent could you make those generalizations? Let me think. Um, I think that, you know, of course, people respond differently to different things, which is, which is um, self-evident enough. Um, I see that um, music therapy in terms of um, when I've offered group classes um, seems to be fairly universal, maybe even more so than music. Um, I look at, um, of course, it might not work for every, everyone. I, I have had people say that it, um, you know, that it just didn't feel right for them. And, and so, you know, I totally respect that. Um, I see these all mind-body practices as a way of resetting our natural rhythms of our nervous system and I'm and so what I mean by that with yoga asana the 
physical practice of yoga. We are taking poses, um, like a, a warrior pose, for example. We're putting our body into a stressful situation with, with our musculature. Our heartbeat is speeding up, just like it would when we exercise. And the, and the, the teacher is, is training us to breathe slowly. So we're literally training ourselves to deal with the stressful situation from a physical perspective. And that is helping us to sort of reset that physical rhythm of our body. Um, and then with meditation, we are, you know, working on maybe a more subtle level with our brain waves and our breath and learning to concentrate our mind into the present moment at the same time that we're becoming more aware of potentially stressful um, parts of our psyche. Um, and, um, and similarly with sound therapy, I like to call it training wheels for meditation. So in a way it, it is helping our minds to get into that more subtle meditative state. Um, so, um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but um, I see all of these um, practices as just ways of resetting the rhythms of our nervous system, which has physical implications as well as psychological implications. Um, so, um, yeah, I see that the, the body is, is part of this um, sort of spiritual or question. And a lot of times when we talk about psychology or spirituality, we totally discount the body. Um, and yet, um, without bodies, we wouldn't be here having these conversations. So, um, so I, I think it's an, it's an important component. Um, but as we know with our bodies, you know, we have, we have drugs on the market that work for most people, but they don't work for everyone exactly the same. Um, and so, um, you know, every single person, just to echo Brittany's sentiment, has to be first informed and educated, and second, um, you know, be able to make an educated choice for themselves. Um, and so, um, that's part of what I like to do with, um, with communicating it in an educational way is just to give people um, some information to make a better choice. Um, Jonathan, you sort of moved on, but uh, I know that you prepared some slides. If you want to show them, um, you certainly can. If you don't want to, fine. Um, sure, let's see. Well, I, I sort of talked about that already, but um, basically, um, we'll, let's just move on. I think right. I'm good with that. Um, so, um, just to kind of continue talking uh, before we do some practices, um, I have some some notes here on the next part of my. Um, some ideas to share was just about repatterning um, and how does trauma actually occur. Um, so, um, just one moment. Um, Somebody have something to say? Well, just well, my mind was just jumping back to the trauma thing, um, mm -hmm. or in fact, in a sense, linking both the trauma and the music thing we've just said. Because um, my sense is it's, that there's, from, from the music piece, there's something around how diff different people respond differently. And I've heard a sort of claim that using music with people who've been professional musicians is a bad idea. Because <laughs> you, you play something that's, that they think is, you think it's going to be nice and soothing and they're reacting to it. And I think what that actually just means is you're recognizing the diversity that's in the room rather than making an assumption that somebody will react in the same way as I do. Mm -hmm. And maybe for the trauma thing, there's something about, again, about just recognizing the range that's in the room, um, which is, 
there's a void putting the, the traumatized label on somebody. And I suppose the model I've got there, um, I'm going to a psychoanalytic supervisor when I was working in a retreat center. And the thing that really struck me was there were bits of me showing up in the room that are normally well buried. And there was just something about her being sufficiently trustworthy to mm -hmm. mean that you turn up as a whole person. Mm -hmm. And I've, um, I don't quite know how you do it, but there's something in my mind about um, the aim being to enable somebody to be a whole person there and therefore not having to defend themselves. Which doesn't really map onto specific bits of technique, but it kind of holds the trauma thing in a, um, in a way that gives it a lot of space mm -hmm. and kind of recognizes that maybe all of us, um, part of our spiritual journey is actually processing bits of our own traumatic pasts. Yeah, I 100% I agree. Um, and in my own experience, that was the case too. Um, many times we talk about, you know, experiencing um, sort of spiritual uh, sorts of expanded consciousness, but in, in some ways healing is also about embracing and experiencing our own humanity and the fact that we we are people with needs you know we have um, physical needs and desires and and um and you know um i don't know if you're familiar with the term of the shadow um but you know we all we all maybe hide or repress parts of ourself um that we're not desiring to show the public because you know the public um, has told us that uh, certain aspects are not acceptable. Um, you know, expressing anger, um, uh, shame, these types of things. Um, and so I really think that in my experience, um, really coming to grips and embracing all of those parts of myself was the healing. And um, after that, I felt like a freed child. I mean, I just had no inhibitions. I said what, um, what came to my mind, even if I thought it was not going to be accepted. And to my sh shock and amazement, it landed well more often than not. Um, and um, so I think just to echo what you're saying, yes, embracing all the parts of ourself um, and also we may not be totally aware of the parts of ourselves that are re repressed. I certainly was not. And, um, and, um, you know, I had this wonderful cathartic experience and, it, and I've had several since, but I, what I find is my daily practice of meditation helps me to stay in touch with my humanity and to also embrace the humanity of other people. And that's really, I feel what compassion is. Um, um, yeah, so that's, I'll end my comments there. Any other thoughts on that? Thank you, Mark. Um, okay, I just want to talk just a little bit about um, how trauma may originate and how this could relate to sound as therapy. Um, so I'm going to go through a little checklist, um, and this is a very generic checklist, but how mental trauma may originate. Um, step number one, there's an outer event. So maybe when we were young, our parents said, um, you know, you're no good at that thing or whatever it is. So there was an outer event that happened. Step number two, we form a perception of that event. We, you know, we begin to create um, a belief or an interpretation or a story around that event. Um, next, we might begin to form a new identity or a worldview based on these perceptions and beliefs that originated with that event. And so we begin to sort of solidify this new identity of ourselves. Um, and finally, our physiology adapts to this new sort of mental view. And as our physiology adapts, it adapts to respond to outside stimuli. So we begin to 
almost create a continual pattern of stress based on these self-adopted perceptions. Now, as we're children, we don't have, or at least I didn't, maybe you did, but uh, the tools, the psychological tools to understand where an adult was coming from. You know, we didn't understand their woundedness. We didn't understand, um, you know, what, what their behavior was uh, caused by. Um, and so it's only as we grow older that we begin to have the psychological tools to sort through that. However, the perceptions that were formed when I was younger are so sort of calcified and solidified um, as reality. Um, it, it takes quite a bit of understanding to look back intellectually because what I've found too is that those patterns, those energetic patterns and those physical patterns become part of my body um, and part of my breath sequence, part of my muscle tension, um, part of the way I hold myself. Um, and so I see the opportunity with the sound therapy or any mind body practice is a way to begin to change the breath patterns, um, to release tension from those muscles. And when that occurs, what I've realized in my own experience, um, is that first I feel relaxed and, but then later some of those old patterns, fears, or perceptions may kind of arise in my, um, conscious mind. Um, and then I have a chance to sort of understand them, reprocess them and let them go. Um, does that make sense? Um, and saying it that way is very simple. Um, however, you know, as I've sort of navigated this process for myself, I've realized, um, you know, our mind can be very elusive and illusory. Um, and what we think is absolutely real can be hard to objectively analyze. And so one of my, um, skills that I'm continually developing is the ability to become objective about my own feelings, my own emotions, and my own perceptions. Um, and, um, and by doing so, um, helping myself go through that process of healing. And I think echoing back to what Brittany was saying about trauma-informed um, practice is I think that um, helping others develop this skill of objectivity um, is a way um, to um, help someone navigate that process because no one can heal for me. Only I can heal for myself. Um, it doesn't matter, you know, who the, who the psychologist or the, the healer or whatever it is. Ultimately, I have to walk the path. Um, myself. Um, and so I, I've come to feel that um, just helping others talk about that path together, um, as well as understanding some of those steps um, are important. Um, and then I'm, I'm going to quickly go through five steps, or actually four, um, that I've realized um, that help me maintain a sort of Rosetta Stone of that path of reality. Um, and number one is that it's always now. So whatever my mind may bring to me in terms of the future or the past, fundamentally, it's always now. And I need to see through the lens of now. What is happening right now? Um, where am I? What's, what's the room like? Um, and things like that. Number two, to choose love and not fear. Um, this was something that helped me get through that difficult um, week of um, anxiety. Um, to, to 
really ask myself, what is the path of love? And sometimes that can be difficult to determine. Um, number three is to do no harm. In yoga, we have this um, word ahimsa, which, which is basically non-harming. And um, so to do no harm to myself or others. Um, and when we're processing those deep emotions, when I've been in that situation of processing deep emotion, I might face terrible anger, you know, some rage at somebody's past um, actions, rage at myself, um, feelings, I've, I've faced feelings of suicide, you know, some very intense um, emotion, but to realize that this too will pass. And, um, and sometimes there are deep lessons in those difficult emotions. Um, you know, and, and I think it's Buddhism, but they say no mud, no lotus. And sometimes those intense emotions are, are fertile ground for blossoming. Um, and it sort of pushes us out of the, um, shell or the cocoon of the caterpillar so um so those are just some thoughts um but those have been my rosetta stone and ultimately the difference between love and fear is trust and with any kind of trauma we sort of lose the ability to trust um to trust even intimate relationships um so in my process i've learned to develop a relationship with what you might call god or the universe and to trust in love essentially and even when it looks like it's not the best move to act in love you know maybe my self-interest could say it's better to do this or that um, i feel like my relationship with the universe and God is to trust in doing the right thing. Um, and, um, you know, I, I view that, um, that sort of story of Christ as his path was to, tr that, to trust, um, that, um, that energy essentially. Um, so, you know, whether that, that particular, tradition resonates with you or not um i'm not i'm not asking you to de determine but just to look at that path of love and um that path of either selfishness or self-interest or the path of selflessness um, and incidentally that's also the path of our survival instinct and our fear-based nervous system for opening up to our higher processing um, power. So these, these um, sort of archetypes and um, stories, I think, are there to remind us about ourselves. Um, um, anyway, those are some random sort of veered off the track there. But um, so um, any, any comments or questions so far? Uh, all beautifully said, Jonathan. I just love it. Okay. Um, anyone have a question or comment? Uh, hello, this is Jody. Can you all hear me? Hi, Jody. Yes. Hi. I just wanted to introduce myself. Pardon me for being late. Um, I have really thoroughly enjoyed what I heard thus far. And um, I just wanted to give my introduction and say one of the reasons why I was drawn to uh, be here today is because I'm very interested in this notion of frequency. Um, and I don't know if perhaps I missed it. I may have to listen to the... Uh, to the playback to see if I've missed the conversation around frequency, but uh, thank you for your time and just wanted to say hello. 
Hi, thank you. Um, just to recap really quick, frequency is essentially how frequently something happens. Um, and um, there's a little bit more in depth in the podcast and at the beginning of the, the talk. And we veered from that into the, the trauma bit um, because um, my view is that all of this is about healing trauma. But what happens with trauma is we typically create cognitive dissonance, which is stress in our body and mind. And we typically lose the ability, when I say we, I'm talking about my experience, um, lose the ability to even trust myself. Um, and that's sort of a function and of that experience and sound healing can help us to sort of reset that pattern. Um, and um, just relaxation can help us reset the pattern. And um, some, sometimes it's possible that a person could even find relaxation disconcerting. Um, because if we use stress to sort of hold control on, on things. Um, so I think the next little bit I would like to touch on is just um, some practices um, using the sound and the breath. And I will say that the purpose behind these is really to consciously begin to reset our patterns. Um, and our rhythmic patterns. Um, and many times we're unconsciously in a pattern of maybe shortened breath, intense um, tension in our body. Um, and so we wanna consciously adopt patterns that are relaxing. Um, for example, we, it's well known that if we breathe in um, for say four, counts and then breathe out for six we're we're breathing out for a little longer than our um, inhale and that's going to activate the parasympathetic nervous system for relaxation um, uh, so anytime someone goes through anxiety a common um, first step is to work on the breath um, so we're going to combine that with um, some basic uh, music to guide that process. Um, so I'm going to take just a second to try to pull up my music file. If anybody has any comments while I do that. Yeah, I just want to say if, if you all um, want to, um, you know, get a, just get a recording of this session or, um, you know, you want a link to you know, Jonathan's podcast, um, and I don't have your email address. I have some of your email addresses. So just put it in the chat, and I'll make sure you get it. Mm -hmm. um. So I'm going to have to um, test the sound first. So if you guys will let me know if you can hear this, I'm gonna push play. Inhale, two, three, and exhale, two, three. Everyone can hear that okay? Okay, wonderful. So um, this exercise is gonna be about five minutes long and we're gonna inhale for four counts and exhale for five. So this should be a very gentle um, sort of introduction to the breath. Um, just to echo what we already said, if anybody doesn't feel comfortable with this, feel free to take your own pace. Um, if you don't like the inhale, exhale count, just do what's comfortable for you or simply um, breathe at your own pace. Feel free to just listen um, along. So first, let's just take a deep breath in together. Inhale. And let that out. Okay, let's try that again. Take a deep breath in. 
and exhale. Now, as we breathe in and out, I'd like you to just notice which one feels like you're really releasing. Take a deep breath in and exhale. So I find that I feel more release on the exhale. And I also notice that my mind is a little more quiet on the exhale. And um, studies have shown that when we're exhaling, we're really activating our parasympathetic nervous system. And when we're inhaling, we're sort of on that other side of our nervous system. And so um, typically when we relieve, re receive some news of relief or release, what do we do? We go, ah, oh, and we breathe a sigh of relief is what we've called it. And when we get shocked or surprised, what do we do? We go, oh, oh my gosh, you know? And so we take that inhale to prepare for fight or flight. Um, and so the whole cycle is just in a one single breath and we can pay attention to our breath. So as we listen to this music, I would like you to um, notice your breath um, and notice, notice sort of the state of your mind on the out breath and in breath. So I'd like you to, um, if possible, if you choose to go with this count, to count internally the numbers on the inhale, one, two, three, four, and on the exhale, one, two, three, four, five. And that will just help to concentrate the mind um, on a single task. Everybody clear on that? Okay. So here we go. And um, this music just starts right in at the beginning. So uh, with the counting, so feel free to jump in uh, whenever you'd like. And this is about five minutes long. Okay, so here we go. Inhale. Thank you. 
exhale. Let's gently begin to bring our awareness back outwards to the sound of my voice. So does anyone have any feedback? Um, how do you feel? Did that work for you, not work for you? I was yawning so much toward the end. <clears throat> Yeah, yawning can be a good sign of, of release too. Anyone else? I can also hear the inner sounds is so much louder than I usually do. The inner sound is like really there. Wow, mm -hmm. very powerful right now. Mm. <laughs> nice. Mm. You you mean like a, a sound inside of your being? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, to the conversation earlier about how does this work for musicians, I, I felt honestly that the rhythm reminded me of a metronome a little bit, and so it was a little jarring for me. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, I really loved the tone of your voice. That part was incredibly soothing. Um, thank you so much for sharing your practice. I actually need to get to a facilitation, so I'm going to get off the call, but thank you so very much. I just love that we can have spaces like this, especially over the internet where we're sharing wisdom, especially about such an important topic. So thank you all so much. Mm -hmm. Thanks for joining us, Brittany.
I also okay. noticed the, my desire to want to comment on the music to myself at, toward mm -hmm. the beginning. And, and I remember you saying that that's what we do, you know, the left, left hemisphere was coming in. So mm -hmm. then I just let that go. Yeah. Um, and that was, you know, specifically a little bit more of a musical sounding uh, track since I used guitar. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, perhaps it would have been better for me to use something with bowls, but um, um, since that has a little bit of melody and harmony and rhythm. Um, so we've got a few more minutes. We could, we could always try another track um, if you guys are up for that or whatever you think we should do, John, Angela. Angela. <laughs> uh, yeah. I I don't know. I, I could go another five minutes. I do have to make some announcements at the end, but um, you know, whatever okay. everybody wants to do is fine. Okay. So maybe a show of hands or what? Um, is everybody okay with doing one more about the same length? Yes. Okay. Um, So I'm going to uh, test the sound again, just to see what this is, if this is a good level. Inhale and exhale. Can you hear that okay? Inhale okay. and exhale. I'm gonna start that from the beginning. So this is the same count. Um, and also with, with a rhythm. Um, uh, this will be using the, the Tibetan bowls, however. And okay, so here we go from the beginning. And exhale. Inhale.
Okay, let's bring our attention back outwards. And I noticed that we're down to about a minute, so I wanted to give us some time to to say say goodbye and let John make some announcements. Angelo. <laughs> <laughs>